Spoken Label. Hi guys, it's Andy N again, back in the house again for Spoken Label. Now, back in the last year, I met, a, met this writer we were going to talk to today on a book launch that Amanda was at actually, on, run by Hit Dragons, and I got talking to her at the interval, as I do, and I got talking about the other work this writer's been doing, and we agreed to have a chat on Skype, so... So, do you want to introduce yourself to everybody? Tell them who you are and where your writing originally came from, and we'll start from there. Okay, hi, I'm uh, Mara Mayland. I'm a writer of romance and sci fi and some bizarro. And uh, I started writing um, mainly because, well, I was kind of bored at the weekends. I like to <laughs> read and I like to write. That sounds good to me then. And obviously, if people won't know, is we've got, I, know you, I know you've got a glass of wine in your hand tonight as well. So do, does the wine come into influence on it sometimes, does it? Well, you say I've got a glass of wine, but most of that wine's gone now. So uh, <laughs> it's been more than 15 minutes of that's called the refill. <laughs> <laughs> sounds good to me. But obviously, like, I know obviously we've got to talk about your writing in some depth then. But had you, had you always had an interest in writing when you were younger? Um, yes. So I started writing short stories I would probably say my teens, you know, I think everybody kind of experiments at that age and kind of does a little bit of writing. And then I went to um, university and did a creative writing course, which I learned absolutely nothing from. <laughs> and then from there, <laughs> uh, I, I, I just kind of dabbled. And as soon as you get a laptop, I think one of the first things you do is open up Word and start kind of putting some words down. And I've just never really stopped, really. Oh, cool. So cool. Well, was there any, any sort of writers that particularly influenced you? To make you want to try the writing you do now. Yeah, I mean, it sounds really cliched, but I think when I was 11 or 12, um, I started raiding my dad's um, library. So when I, I grew up in a house that was full of books, and none of them were off. Um, we weren't allowed to read, you know, we could read any of them, um, no matter how scary they were, because my dad was a big believer of, well, your mind will make it as scary as you can deal with. So we were allowed to read whatever we did, we wanted to, and uh, so I did, and I read a lot of Stephen King. Oh, brilliant. I think... Exactly, and, and I think he's such a good introduction to fiction because obviously he's done such a, a wide, varied kind of. Yeah, you know, he's, he's got everything from Rita Hayworth to Dolores Claiborne to The Stand, and you know, it, it just touches everything. Yeah, he's good. Um, I do so like some of his stuff, books, of, actually, certainly, yeah. What's your favourite book by Stephen King then? Are you any favourites? I think I'm going to go against the great because everybody loves The Stand. The Stand is, is, is my go to book, but I absolutely adore Dolores Claiborne, and I think that's kind of underrated. A lot of people don't. Don't really notice that one. It goes under there. Yeah, it's not one of his more famous books, that's for sure, certainly. So I know I I have read that a few years ago as well. That was wasn't there a film version of that? Wasn't there a film version of that with Kathy Bates and I imagine things? I think is that not uh, misery? Misery. I know she did misery. I I hold shoulders. I I could be wrong. Anyway, I said, but no, you're certainly right. No, it's it's a good book that was Dolores Carver one. Certainly, I think mine's mine is honest. It's a short sanctuary redemption actually. Or Rita Hayworth and the Shaw Sam's Redemption. Because I just Funnily com- enough, I listened to that on audio book last week actually. Oh did you? Who did, who did the audio on it? It was a really old one, the sound of it wasn't good. It sounded like it was done in the nineties. Um it was from uh, Audible. I can't remember, I think it was Frank, somebody or other who did the narration. It was good oh. though. I would love to hear Morgan Freeman read that book. Mm. Because knowing that film, he reduced me to tears frequently, he did, and and you could really feel him in the book as well as that. Where, well, so it's perfect casting, certainly so. But obviously, in relation to your own writing, I know we were talking off mic before, and you've done a series, haven't you? Is it the Incomplete series, which is a series uh-huh. of four novellas. Now, where did this come from? Then? So, um, the original one, uh, which was called Incarnate, which is book one, um, was a submission for a anthology by uh, P&K Press. It was called Kinked. And it was a, an erotic um, anthology, so I thought, oh, I've never written on, you know, that kind of stuff before, so I'll give it a go. And funnily enough, right at the start of my career, of all the short stories I've submitted, erotica seems to be the one I'm most successful with, oh, which, right. is, which is quite interesting or concerning. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'm just going to pass on that comment, okay? So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to say, I know we've got, we could have been Barry partner who's probably sat in the background there, but I'll just move on, okay? But I certainly <laughs> like it's, had you, had you read any erotica together before you started doing the series? Um, I did a blog post about this about three or four weeks ago, and um, I think every woman kind of, or every man, I suppose as well, um, touches on erotica. It's one of those, it's one of those, um, it's one of those areas of fiction that people kind of 
lie about. They don't t- they don't say that they read it. They don't say that they write it. Um, I think it comes across as vulgar and fast. But writing erotica is probably what's taught me the most about being a good writer. Oh, really? Because sure. yeah, because erotica relies so much on character. You have to get those characters right, or the rest of it falls down. It's got no plot devices. It's got nothing else to rely on, really. If those characters aren't real, if they're not um, convincing, if you don't feel for them, you won't read to the end. Yeah, yeah, I get it completely. Um, my partner Amanda, I don't know if you know this, Amanda's actually, I know, had written some erotica herself, but we'll, we'll get her to have a chat with Mike later, because I know I know she's got a story about that herself, so that's her story. Now. But no, in relation to these, and what you did then, um, how was it quite a quick first book to write them was it yeah i mean I, I'm, I'm quite lucky in fact that i can get between maybe two and four thousand words a day when i when i really sit down and focus and um, so going. the first sorry what was that that's some going that is completely two to four thousand words certainly yeah yeah I, I mean i do i do write quite fast um but i also find that i don't get caught up in the detail so a lot of writers that i speak to say they, they agonize over um, descriptions or over getting the right word in the right sentence and I just get it down because you can fix it later if it's not right you can go through the second and then you can change those things that you want whereas you can't fix something if it's not there yeah yeah of course completely so I get it completely do you when you get to the crunch of your writing do you have a sort of set writing pattern do you or do you just do what you uh, I don't obviously wait when it grabs you it grabs you you're that sort of writer then you um, I'm a routine writer, so I'm not a believer in the muse or waiting for inspiration. Um, I will sit down and go, right, today I'm writing, so what am I going to write about? And I just start typing, and I have no idea where I'm going. It might start with a paragraph, it might start with a smell of something, it might start with somebody starting an argument, and it will go from there. Um, I do find that if I just troll through um, Twitter or Facebook, you know when you see these pages of calls for submission? Yeah, yes, of course. Yeah, I find that they're quite good. Um, I don't want to say muses or inspiration, but sometimes something they'll go, oh, I think I could do something with that. And then I'll sit down and write that story and submit it and off it goes. So I, I'm, I'm not a somebody who waits for inspiration. I do routine Saturday, Sundays, and then some evenings and I, I, I get down. Whether I've got an idea or not, I, I sit in front of the laptop and I start typing. Yeah, yeah, I get it completely. Because I'm really a poet by nature and I have spells and I write absolute loads and sometimes if I'm busy doing like podcasts like yourself or doing the music even, it goes a bit backwards and forwards to me sometimes. That's why. But mm. I'll get you completely. I'm, I've got my hand believer. I'm being created somewhere or another all the time, every time I'm not in yeah. work. So I'll get you completely there with that. So makes good sense, certainly. Now, obviously, like I said before, in your these novellas, you've done four and to date, haven't you? So mm-hmm. how did your approach change now as the series developed? Um. So... These novellas were quite... I, di- I didn't want to do a romance or an erotic that, that, that just would lie with every, every other erotic book. I didn't want to do something where it was a famous rich guy that's, that got with their poor underdog of the woman. So every single one of these novellas focuses on a different life stage. So the first one was uh, Incarnate, and that's Young Love. So it's you know it's a couple getting together. It's the first flushes of love and that, that miscommunication where you don't talk to each other because you're scared of what the other one will say. Mm, and then yeah. the second one was called Incapable, and that was a um, it was a, a bit later in it was a, the later stages of life. So that's about you, well you've been married, you've had a child, and now you're single. The, the, the lead character is a single parent, and how she deals with romance and how she deals with introducing her daughter to somebody new. So then the third one was about um, an even later stage of his life, which is kind of in the post for everybody, decline of health. So the main character has cancer, which was quite a tough one to write. Oh, yeah, so um, I needed to make sure that that was right. You know, you can't touch that kind of that kind of idea without doing a disservice to somebody. So I try, I, you know, I talk to a lot of people to make sure that I got the right things in that, not just about the physical aspects of cancer, but also the emotional aspects. You know, you can... It can really create a loss, a grieving, you know, you're grieving for body parts, for that that feeling of being healthy all the time. And then the fourth one is the very last stage of life. It's about a man who's uh, lost his wife, he's now grieving, and he's trying to get over that by, with a new romance, and his absolute, you know, he's, he's been married to this woman for so long, and he doesn't <coughs> want to be with anybody else, and how can he even think about being in a romance? So for me, I approach these novellas as a different stage of life, and that made me approach the writing slightly differently. 
<coughs> but the incarnate one is obviously is it a little bit more I don't want to say childish because that's not the right word but it's less focused on the bigger ideas it's more about the immediacy of romance and then by the time you get to the last one it's very it, it's dealing with the emotional impact of romance instead of just the physical aspect yeah yeah I get it completely so you've, the characters like I've gone on the journey basically like the fall of novellas really so yeah get it completely I wouldn't have, I've, I've basically that's good writing straight away with that now, you've obviously taught up before, haven't you? I know you write other stuff besides these as well. And you've had quite a bit of stuff published in anthologies as well, haven't you? I have, yeah. I'm quite lucky in that. In that yeah. yeah. And obviously, like I said before, is it, are, are you, um, you're, well, based on some words, right? To put up a teeth here. The stuff you've had published in anthologies, has it been like romance stuff as well? Have you, have you had success with other stuff in your writing as well? No, I'm quite lucky in the fact that it's a cross-genre. So I've had comedies published um, in um, Son of a Witch, which is by World Reader Press. Um, it's a, like a magical anthology. I've had um, uh, horrors. I've had sci-fis. Uh, I've, I've, I've even dipped my little toe into um, Bizarro, which was quite a yeah, learning curve. I've not heard of Bizarro before. If Amanda was here, she'd probably tell me what Bizarro was. But... Um, but what is Bizarro for people who don't know? I'm sorry, I'm playing total ignorance here. No, no, do you know what? You, um, I've just picked up the book now, and in, on the very back, it's got the Wikipedia definition, so I can read it out for yes. you, actually. Yes, please. So, bizarro fiction is a contemporary literary genre which often uses elements of absurdism, satire, and the grotesque, along with pop surrealism and genre fiction staples, in order to create subversive, weird, and entertaining works. Right, yeah. So I'm not quite sure what that means, apart from I did a horror story that was very strange and there was no explanation to it, you know, of what was going on in the story. Right, that explains why. Yeah, it does sound like something um, a bit off bit off on a different tangent, certainly. So mm. that's why. But before, do you find that, is it easy for you to switch from one style of writing to the other? Oh, absolutely. I, I don't struggle with that whatsoever. Um, I find that I'm, I'm more comfortable in the horror slash sci-fi um, areas than I am in romance but funnily enough I've had more success with romance and erotica yeah. than I have with any of the other genres it's a bit, it's a bit strange so it's always a bit bizarre you just, you just don't think so, you, you write like don't always go the way it wants to go sometimes do so I mean your case it took off in a direction that I suspect you probably didn't expect really in the first place did you so which is a good no, thing I'm anyway, quite lucky in fact that um, because I've had quite a few short stories published in a short period of time and they're all cross genre I've not been pigeonholed or at least I've not been so far um, so because I've released across all these different genres people aren't expecting the next stuff to be romance or the next stuff to be erotica I can start my career from I'm just going to do what I want to do and you can read it or not read it yeah do you um, do you anticipate you would actually want to write a full length novel someday hmm yeah um, so I'm currently about 50,000 words uh, in a it's, it's women's fiction. It's not erotica, but it's women's fiction. Um, I'm trying to write something. Um, so I've got some some knowledge of um, some like office politics. Oh, blimey, I can relate so, to that. I can relate to that. <laughs> I, can yes, I, I think we all can. And I think we all like to read about that and to see what's <laughs> going on, what's the latest gossip. So I'm trying to kind of create a novel at the minute that surrounds triumphing in a, in a vicious political arena. Oh, fantastic. How long have you been working on this novel for up to date then? Um, I would say probably about nine months. Um, but I keep coming and going because I find it quite difficult. I've also got another work in progress, which is a, I'm, I'm doing a, I'm going to try and do my own anthology of 12 um, bizarro stories in one novel. So yeah. I both can divide my time between the two of Yeah, I, know, I'm, I tend to be like that with poetry. I often have like, a couple of big projects on it all at once normally. I've got, like I said, I'll take that back in a time, but I tend to, I don't tend to stick with that one set formula all the time. So, like, it's, I think it's a writer. Do you think it stops you getting bored if you're moving on between the various projects? Um, I, I, I don't like to do it. Um, the only reason I'm doing it is because I'm finding this political office drama. I know what I want to do, but it's not coming very easily. I'm, I'm wondering if it actually is a bit too big for me at the minute. I might come back to it in a couple of years. Um, I do like to stick with one project. I like to write while it's hot. And it's in my mind, and I don't like to deviate from that story. Um, it's probably why that 
So the obvious politics kind of story is taking me a little bit longer. I think every time I step away from it, you have to refresh your mind. What was I thinking about when I was writing there? What yeah, yeah. I'm going for in this chapter? And you, you lose that, you lose that, well, I do, I should say. Um, I lose that emotion of what I was trying to get in a specific time of writing. Yeah, yeah, I'm getting completely with it, certainly. So obviously these are future projects you're talking about. Do you have any sort of publications coming up or anything you can, you can talk about? Um, I don't at the minute. Um, I had the incomplete, which, I, like I was saying to you before, I'm quite lucky enough that my four novellas were successful enough for them to want to release under one cover. Um, so that was released on the 31st of December, which is which is great, and I, I think it's doing really well. Um, but I have submitted, uh, I think I've got five short stories out in the market at the minute. So cool. I'll probably hear over the next six to eight weeks whether or not any of those were sold. Cool. Have you done? Um, I know. I believe you've done right. You've done the readings of the of her name, haven't you? So have you done any? Um, have. have you done many readings of Wise and generally in Togo? No. Um. I've actually. Huh, I've been a coward. I've, I've failed <laughs> on on one of them. Um. T- and to be fair, I was busy that evening, but I could possibly <laughs> have got out of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of I was so nervous about doing it that I kind of I, I failed. The one that you saw me out was uh, my first ever reading, and uh, I was quite drunk. <laughs> <laughs> got, to, got to be done sometimes with your first reading, that one, I always say. Because I've been doing this before me for about 10 years or so now, and it's like, it doesn't tend to, very, very few worries me nowadays, because when you, when it's your first time, I suppose it can be quite hard sometimes, straight away, so. But that's why, but no, fair play. So, if people want to find out more about you, where are the best going? Um, they're probably best off going to my website, which is www.maramailings.com, or to my Twitter profile, which is just at Mara Mailings. Cool. Well, we'll get them put down here. I know you're going to read something out for us afterwards in a few moments, aren't you? So, so well, what will that be in the case then? We'll pause the recording for you, and we'll both get ready for mm-hmm. that. So, everybody hang around, because we'll be right back to you in a minute or two. See you all in a minute. Thanks again. Peace in. Spoken me. Spoken me. Hi guys, it's Andy again. Straight over to my new friend now. It's got an ex- is that an extract. This is it. A story from what you're reading now, isn't it? It is, yeah. Okay, tell us what the story is called, and we'll take it away. So the story is called uh, Double or Nothing, and it's in the Fire Demons, Dragons, and Gins um, anthology edited by Rhonda Parrish. So, double or nothing. Are you sure you want that to be your strategy? Cole said, his sour breath wafting down my neck. I turned my head away, irritated and focused on the hand. I shuffled through the cards once more, hesitating over two before sliding one from the fan I was holding. I gave the figures listed at the bottom of the card a cursory glance, unnecessary since I had them all memorised, before tossing it onto the table. Poole groaned in my ear. Oh, you should have saved that one. Piss off, Poole, let me be, I murmured shoving him away with my shoulder. Poole immediately took a step backwards. His breath, soured by his constant chewing of salamander berries, was really distracting. I never chewed myself, precisely because of the bad breath, so having him breathe over my shoulder was really starting to make my stomach turn. Sitting opposite, the stone-like mass of Flick leaned forward to take a closer look at my card. He was so huge that watching him move was like watching an earthquake ripple through the earth. Surprise rippled over his face, but it was quickly shut down. You sure you want to play that old hoss? His voice was as deep as a cavern. <clears throat> I pushed my hair out of my eyes and nodded. I am. You want to play the water hydro? I do, I said, determined not to show the doubt starting to bloom in my stomach. As soon as I said the words confirming my move, the field over the table locked down. I heard it more than saw it. It, um, it made a high-pitched zoo noise, almost too high for me to hear. As soon as the table locked down, Flick grinned, and my stomach started to clench. Oh, man, Poole whined. He's got something planned. So do I, I said out of the corner of my mouth. Poole, an incredibly ugly man with acne erupting from the greasy skin of his cheekbones and temples, smiled. It was an honest smile, one he only ever used when he felt immense relief. <laughs> you better, he answered, still smiling, because I can't go back to my husband and tell him I've lost both of our ships betting on your sorry hide. I didn't answer. Instead, I shoved my shoulder into him again, forcing him to move away. His breath was truly repellent, and it was really starting to piss me off. I stared over at Flick, who was staring back, a smile curling across his lips. The way he was looking at me reminded me of the way a hungry dog looked at a steak. 
On the table, my card burst into flames, birthing a creature about ten inches high. I'd used this card only once before, and then only because the hand was certain, so I couldn't help but pull my eyes from Flick's stony face and admire the water hydra. It had nine wolfish heads, each snapping and snarling. Its legs were thick with muscle, its chest broad and strong. Water ran down its milky body in rivulets, pooling at its feet. What's your move, Flick? I asked. Flick took a quick sip of the oily drink he was holding, then put the glass down on the side table. He selected a card and threw it down on the table, but even before it hit the steel, I was leaning forward, craning my neck to see his choice. It was the Herebo, the legendary spirit from Japan who stops waterfall. I fist-pumped my triumph under the table, careful to keep my expression neutral. One of the things that aggressive card players like Flick always forgot was that the Hydra's heads were separate beings. I was casting the equivalent of nine cards at once. It might not be the strongest card in terms of attack, but whatever damage the Hydra might take would only damage one of its heads. If it was enough to kill the head, well, two group in its place. Its defence was undeniable. Behind him, I heard Poole whoop in victory. The table gave another noise, locking both of our cards into the game, and Flick's Fiorobo manifested itself an old Japanese lady who carried an elegant Asian parasol over her shoulder. At the sight of her, my hydra threw back all nine heads and roared, though the sound was tinny, dampened by the shield. The old lady, hunched and crooked as she was, blinked mildly at the sound. Flick raised his glass in my direction, saluting me. Then he raised his finger and touched the shield, starting the round. The Hirobo took a small step towards my great beast, then another, then another. When she got within a few inches, she held the parasol high into the air. I expected something hugely magical to happen, like a battle for the Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones, but instead a white mist started to creep from beneath the paper parasol. It edged towards the Hydra slowly, like a fog coming down a steep mountainside. As soon as it touched the Hydra, an intense sizzling filled the air. The Hydra's skin started to turn white and boil away. I watched with bated breath as the Hydra roared in pain, gnashing its teeth in agony. The first of its nine heads melted away like a pat of butter in a pan, sizzling and spitting. My old lady never fails, Flick said, watching me knock the table. I've been building her for years. She has the strength of nine hydras, even if they had all nine heads. Poole was moaning again, the victory he felt only moments ago already forgotten. Just wait, I whispered out the corner of my mouth. It's not over yet. The hydra was still melting. The acidic mist had boiled away three of its heads and was showing no sign of stopping. I was starting to get nervous. Just wait, I mumbled again, more to myself this time. Then it stopped. The Hydra had lost only four of its heads, and they were already going back. Over the table, I grinned at Flick, whose jaw was pulsing as he clenched his teeth in obvious anger. Are you fucking kidding me? He looked down at the glass, and I wondered <clears throat> whether we might throw it against the wall. On the table, the Haribo bowed and took several steps backwards, her eyes lowered, waiting for the Hydra's answering attack. At first, the Hydra just stood on the table, pouring at the steel with its foot. What are you waiting for? Stop wasting time, Flip growled. Just do it. I knew exactly what I was waiting for. The Hydra needs all of its heads to grow back to ensure maximum damage. Do you think I was stupid? A level one player? He could rush into making such a careless move? Not this time. Not with so much at stake. When the Hydra was back to full strength, I raised a finger and touched the shield. The Hydra galloped forward, its nine heads snarling and snapping like rabid dogs. The Haribo watched it come at her without flinching. Even as it tore into her, ripping the flesh from her muscles, she didn't utter a sound. And when it was done, the Hydra swaggered around the table. It hadn't left a single scrap of her rival. There was nothing left for Flick to heal. He'd played that card for the last time. No! Rick roared, clambering to his feet and throwing the glass he was holding against the wall, where it shattered into a thousand pieces. The viscous drink oozed down the bar brick, glinting beneath the fluorescent strips hanging overhead. It looks like black blood, I thought, but even the unease I felt couldn't break through my triumph. Flick, I started, then stopped when he whirled to face me, his expression tight with fury. I thought he might actually reach right across the table and pop me upside the head with his huge fist. I even squinted, waiting for the agony to come. But Flick's anger was always fleeting. Quick to fight, quick to forget, I thought, willing my heart to stop thudding. He sat back down, already smiling that barely there smile he had. Double or nothing, old hoss, double or nothing. No way, Poole hissed over my shoulder. Tuttle will kill me, you know he will. For once, stop whilst you're ahead. The last was said in a lower voice directly into my ear. 
What if I put up the fleet? Flick asked, raising an eyebrow. I swallowed. The need to meet the challenge was great, but Poole was right. I had to quit those times ahead. I shook my head. Nah, I couldn't afford to run the fleet even if I won. What if I paid the fuel for the first month? I shook my head, more hesitantly this time. I'd still be as poor after the first month. I can't afford it. You can't afford it, old hoss. I know how well you do at these games. His eyes locked on mine. He was right. I'd become a very wealthy person over the last few years, winning round after round of the game, partly because I was ballsier than the other person I knew, and partly because I had a knack for playing the right card at the right moment. Most of the meatheads, like Flick, played aggressively, attacking on every round instead of alternating with defence when needed. It was like they wanted their cards to reflect the type of man they were, strong, aggressive and violent. That wasn't an issue for me. Maybe so, I said, standing up as if to leave the table, but I don't need your fleet. My cards, then. How about winner takes all? A silence so palpable that I could almost feel it descended on the room. Two other challengers nearby stopped their own game to listen in, their eyebrows almost meeting their hairlines in shock. Nobody ever wagered their entire stock of cards. The better cards took years to build up, and that didn't include the artefacts, the rarest of the cards that could only be gifted to you by the mythical beasts themselves, normally after a particularly strong game. Winner takes all, I said slowly, as if I hadn't heard him. Winner takes all, he repeated. He leaned back in his stone chair as if completely at ease, as if he hadn't just offered the wager of all wagers. A wager I really wanted to take. Is that enough? Is that okay? Fantastic. No, it's excellent. Really, really enjoyed that, did Really, really engaging that was, so brilliant. <laughs> now, we'll let you catch your, we'll let you cut your breath for a second. Probably, I need to talk mm-hmm. to you off mic anyway. But this is, thank you again. So, this is Andy and Sandy out tonight. Fantastic stuff. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. Thank I'll you. I'll speak to you soon, guys. Take care. Bye. Spoken later. Spoken later.